I, I see us both. Okay, let me turn my volume down. Okay. Can you hear me fine? I can hear you perfectly. You'll be able to send me a copy of this afterward? Absolutely. Great. Good. So there was that article that I sent you about this girl who um, basically talks a guy into committing suicide. This just happened two weeks ago, if I recall correctly. Yes. Conrad Roy III was a suicidal guy. He was suicidal before he met her. And then he, he met this girl and uh, she, he had, I guess he had had uh, numerous suicide attempts before he met her. And then uh, once he met her, he suddenly, you know, started getting more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Mm, encouragement. She, you know, she was encouraging him and helping him and, uh, you know, maybe guiding him along a little bit. So I'll ask you the question I asked you a second ago. He committed suicide due to her encouragement. Is she a good person or a bad person? Well, you know, I was rethinking my initial reaction. My initial reaction is he's a horrible person because life is precious and anyone that tells anyone or encourages anyone to commit suicide is uh, highly problematic. And as a, a non-libertarian, I would say she's a disgusting, despicable person. Uh, as a libertarian, the question is, did she violate the law? Uh, the libertarian law, and I don't think so because she didn't initiate violence against anyone. On the other hand, I, I want to retract that or rethink that or maybe uh, complicate it a little bit. It all depends upon why he wanted to commit suicide. For example, if the reason he wanted to commit suicide is he lost a, a girlfriend or he lost a poker game or he failed a course or you know something like that, then I would think the, the virtuous, nice thing is to try to say, look, there are other girls out there, there are other exams out there, Right, right. try again. On the other hand, if he's in terminal stage cancer and he's got excruciating pain and uh, the morphine will not help him, he's just a, a life of unending pain, but he's not got enough courage to commit suicide, then I suppose I would, I would encourage him or help him. Uh, to commit suicide because I, I, I make an exception for uh, excruciating unending pain. Uh, I don't think that that, you know, now again, I'm not speaking as a libertarian, I'm just speaking as an ordinary person. To me, that's an exception. And, and if you commit suicide because of, you know, just excruciating pain that just never ends, well, uh, you're, you're okay in my book. But anything else, including you know some of those examples I just gave uh, I, I think that that's an abominable reason to commit suicide uh, there are other girls other exams other uh, jobs other whatever and if you're humiliated you can always move to another town or something or another country uh, and life is so precious uh, you shouldn't be committing suicide for any other reason but for whatever the reason as a libertarian uh, I look at all, all things through these eyeglasses these libertarian eyeglasses and they only see one thing. Uh, are you initiating violence against uh, innocent people? And if you are, or fraud, or anything like that, or threats, then you're a bad guy. But if you're just uh, engaging in free speech to counsel people to do despicable things, like commit suicide, I, I don't think that uh, you have violated a libertarian law code, and therefore it would be unjust to use violence against you. But is it still <laughs> bad? Yeah, I, I think it's bad, except for the uh, excruciating pain thing. I, I think it's very bad. I'm also an ethicist or a moralist, and in my ethical or moral view, to commit suicide or to counsel anyone to commit suicide for any other reason than that is uh, just uh, uh, very bad and, and I, I think unethical and immoral. So, so let so, me so ask you for a more Austrian opinion, uh, all value being subjective, right? And you say that all, all human life is valuable, but... Um, to a person who is suicidal, subjectively speaking, their life is not valuable. So this guy, he had a miserable life. He, he uh, it's not, it's not like she met this guy and and she convinced him to commit suicide. He was suicidal to begin with, and apparently had attempted a, a number of times. Um, let me see his his grandmother. After he met this girl and she she uh, started encouraging him and helping him and so on, his grandmother grandmother said he seemed to be pulling out of it. In other words, 
he seemed to be happier. Uh, it seems as though he was happier having the idea in his head that, hey, I'm really going to do this, you know? And he was miserable before. Uh, as an Austrian economist, I agree with you. Whenever you engage in human action, you demonstrate, you reveal that you prefer what you do to any other uh, course of action. So you're uh, wearing a black shirt and I'm wearing a blue shirt and um, we can deduce from that as Austrian economists that you valued that black shirt more than the 30 bucks it cost to buy it and I value this blue shirt more than the 10 bucks it cost me to buy it. And um, if you or I, God forbid, so to speak, I'm an atheist, but I can still engage in that discussion, uh, committed suicide, we demonstrate, we reveal that we preferred non-life to life. I agree, as an Austrian economist, uh, he was, uh, his uh, uh, human condition was improved by committing suicide. Yet, as an ethicist, I take a very different view because I think he could have been even more proved that he stayed alive and maybe gone to a therapist or a shrink or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or, or a, a rabbi or a minister or a priest or, you know, anybody and maybe uh, be convinced uh, that life was worth living and, and he could overcome whatever it was that was committing uh, uh, in, in, in dice, enticing him to suicide in the first place. So this isn't the first time that uh, we say some things as an economist, other things as an ethicist, other things as a libertarian. For example, in physics, work means you have to move something. Uh, here's a, a bottle and you have to move it through space. And um, if I hold barbells, 10 pound barbells at my side like this, and I hold them still, uh, the sweat is going to be coming down my brow pretty soon because to hold a barbell like that is very, very hard after a minute or so. And uh, in physics, you're not doing any work. In ordinary language, you're working your rear end off. So this isn't the first time uh, that we can uh, come up with this sort of paradox or uh, 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 paradox, I guess is a good word, of looking at one and the same action through different lenses. And through the Austrian lens, yes, he improved himself by committing suicide. Uh, from the ethical uh, point of view, or at least my ethics, uh, he, he did something very uh, problematic. And from a libertarian point of view, he did not violate the law. So you can look at one and the same thing from different vantage points, from different dimensions, and come up with uh, startlingly different answers. So from a free market perspective, let's say this girl now, uh, let, let's assume, assuming that we're in a free market and there's, there's no government to stop her from doing this. Let's say she opens up, uh, uh, you know, she gets a little shop and she puts out her shingle and says, uh, suicide consultant, suicide. Uh, Not consultant, but suicide encourager. Right. Suicide um, coach, let's say. Good. Better. Right. From, a, a, from an Austrian perspective. She wouldn't be doing anything wrong. In fact, she'd be adding value to the economy in a sense. Well, from an Austrian perspective, she can't do anything wrong uh, because uh, wrong is not a uh, is a it's normative. A judgment, but. It's a value judgment, and Austrianism is a value free. So you can't say she's doing anything wrong. You could ask: Is she uh, increasing the GDP, or is she uh, uh, promoting uh, economic welfare? And I would have to say yes. Right. Uh, that is, if if she gets customers, <laughs> I right, mean, right. if she just opens up her uh, lemonade stand encouraging suicide and nobody comes to her, well, then uh, we could say that she misallocated resources. She could have been a barber or a bricklayer instead. But assuming that she gets customers who pay her for this, that demonstrates that she value that they value her services more than the costs. Right. So, right. so, so from a Austrian perspective, she's at, she's adding value to the economy. From a ethicist perspective, would she be taking uh, value out of the economy? Well, not so much value out of the economy, but I, I think she, it, it's now now that we're in the ethical realm, we're, we're no longer in the economy. Uh, I would say what she's doing is wrong, because uh, in my view of ethics, and other people could have different views of ethics. In my view of ethics, life is very precious, very important, and she's reducing life, so she's reducing um, virtue. Uh, life is virtuous, and, and committing suicide, except for that one uh, exception I mentioned, is uh, not virtuous. So she's reducing the, <laughs> the amount of virtue in the city. So it would be ineconomic to stop her, but it would be ethical? 
Well, I don't think it would be ethical to stop her, and it would certainly be uneconomic to stop her, because uh, she hasn't violated any rights. And look, suppose uh, she set up a different uh, business. The business is you bring in a, a Stradivarius violin, and she'll stomp on it. Okay. <laughs> and a Stradivarius violin is, I don't know, a million dollars. And uh, she stomps on it, in which case it's just worth, uh, uh, you know, firewood. Uh, although I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I think if, if you stomped on a Stradivarius violin, it'd still be worth a lot. But uh, uh, just the arguendo, assume that. Well, then, as an Austrian economist, I'd have to say she's increasing value because the owner of the uh, Stradivarius violin, uh, as a violin, it was worth a million to him, but as a uh, 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 the jumble of wood, it was worth more. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done it. Uh, so, as an Austrian economist, uh, you know, it looks as if she's reducing value because the Stradivarius violin is worth a million, and a lot of people will pay a million, but no, very few people, <laughs> nobody's going to pay a million for uh, a Stradivarius uh, wood, uh, you know, broken in the little pieces. So, uh, we're sort of uh, getting into a very philosophical economic area, but it's interesting. Let's take that example of a Stradivarius violin for, for a second. If somebody else valued the, the Stradivarius more than the uh, the owner of it, and let's say bid two million to her behind the scenes and said, "Listen, give the guy a jumble of wood and grab that Stradivarius and put it in the back room, and I'll come pick it up from you tomorrow," right? Yeah, but that's fraud. Oh. Okay. Uh Right? Isn't that fraud? You know, she uh, has a contract, this lady, <laughs> our, our gal. Uh, she opens up a thing. Uh, I destroy Stradivarius violins, and uh, I bring one in. I want it destroyed. And she sneaks it around and breaks some crappy violin and uh, sells you the Stradivarius for $2 million. Well, she committed fraud on me. I really wanted my Stradivarius uh, broken, and she... Uh, broke uh, uh, you know, uh, a very inexpensive violin to fool me. And uh, for that, she would be violating the libertarian law and she would be a criminal. Uh, she might be increasing value in some objective sense because if you look at the Stradivarius violin objectively, uh, you got it now uh, for your two million and you know, uh, only a, a crappy violin was broken. But as an Austrian economist, I can't um, contemplate or can't acknowledge uh, objective value. I have to look at subjective value. And in subjective value, I wanted mine broken. And I paid her good money for it. And she violated our contract. She just, uh, you know, um, uh, took the, the good violin and put it in the back room and, and then sold it to you. So uh, she violated my rights. So, so, so how would that, that particular fraud be... Um recompense well that's a good one uh, if we found out uh, that she did this I, I don't know we'd sue her and um, we'd uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about that I'd have to think about it but uh, I don't know um, she broke the contract uh, a, a private court would have to decide how much uh, money this is worth and how they would decide they wouldn't be Austrians because Austrians uh, can only decide value based on market transactions and this is not a market transaction but if I were the judge I would uh, you know maybe make her pay a uh, hundred thousand bucks or something and um, and then I would get that violin from you well, and she'd of course have to reimburse the the owner of the uh, of the the original owner of the violin. Well, I'm the original owner of the violin, and I brought it into her. And then what she did is she sold it to you for two million. Well, I would get as the judge, I would say, give me back that violin and make her give you back your two hundred thousand. Because you're innocent. You didn't know that there was fraud. Let's say. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were part of the deal, then we'd look at it differently. But all you knew is she's selling you a violin for two million, and you were happy to have it. So she would have to give you back your two million, and then she would have to uh, br break the violin on the specific performance contracts. Namely, we would compel her to break my violin, and then we would, uh, uh, if I paid her a hundred thousand uh, to do it, let's say. Mm -hmm. Uh, for round numbers, uh, she would have to give that money back to me, and maybe uh, I believe in what is it? Um, uh, libertarian punishment theory is two teeth for a tooth plus cost of capture plus scaring. So we we would impose uh, quite a bit on on this lady, 
uh, we would first of all make her uh, uh, do the job, and then we would um, uh, make. Uh, and let's say she was billing me a hundred thousand for it. First, she'd have to give me back my hundred thousand that I paid for, and then she'd have to give me a hundred thousand of her own from which uh, uh, which she stole from me. And then third, if there were costs of capturing her, we would uh, 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 bill her those costs. Of course. And then fourth, you know, she scared me. She undermined my uh, <laughs> my sense of uh, propriety, uh, my sense of safety, and we would make her play Russian roulette with the number of bullets and the number of chambers proportionate to how badly she scared me. I don't think she scared me too badly, so maybe one bullet in 500 chambers, and we'd make her, you know, pull a gun uh, on her with 500 chambers and one bullet and shoot. And hopefully for her sake, uh, she would come out with 499 so she wouldn't be killed. But uh, I think the libertarian punishment theory is very draconian. We don't much like criminals. And uh, we're very punitive with criminals, and, and they've got to uh, they've got to pay not just to compensate, but uh, they they have to compensate for scaring because uh, you know she scared me in some small sense by committing fraud, fraud against, against me. me. So so let's so, take that example back to this uh, Michelle girl. Michelle puts up her shingle. Uh, this fellow comes in. He says, uh, Michelle, I'd really like to hire your services to uh, coach me to suicide. This boy's grandmother comes to Michelle and says, listen, I'll pay you $100,000 to talk him out of it, to act as a therapist rather than a coach, right? to help him get his life back on track instead of, um, instead of killing himself. And obviously he, what he wants is to kill himself. So let's say she acts in that capacity, coaching him away from suicide rather, to, rather than to suicide. So has she committed fraud? Well, if she tells the boy, uh, hey, your grandmother just gave me uh, more money than you gave me, and I am uh, no longer uh, interested in keeping this contract, or I'll give you your money back or something, uh, I'll give you your money back and I'm keeping your grandmother's, uh, namely if she were totally honest, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, I mean, if you're totally honest, there can't be any fraud, right? Right. So, so in this case, being totally honest would, would cause him to say, well, give me my money back and I'll go find another coach. Right. So that would defeat the purpose of what the grandmother is paying him for. Right. So she'd have to return the grandmother's money, too. Yes. Yes. OK. And now let's take the second case where she doesn't tell the boy and she commits fraud. Right. And she argues him out of she's a good ther she's as good a therapist as she is a, a, a suicide coach. Right. She argues him out of it. He and doesn't commit suicide, and now he's decided that he doesn't. He no longer wants to commit suicide, right? Yep. So she committed fraud, and she's got to be punished for it. That would be the logical implication, although. <laughs> but but would <laughs> but would a judge? Are you saying that it, that a judge maybe should should uh, force her to make restitution and go back and convince him to commit suicide again? Well, that we're getting into reductiosville here. <laughs> this is a good reductio ad absurdum. I love it. This is magnificent. Uh, <laughs> I don't like where you're heading me. I don't like where you're pushing me, but I appreciate the push. Uh, yes, if I'm going to be consistent, what you just said follows. Uh, let me give you another example. Not to change the subject because it's uncomfortable. We'll get even, though, even though let's say it's no longer necessarily what he wants. Yeah, well, look, if he insists, look, he might now say, I'll forgive you. You, you, right. you, you dirty rat, you committed fraud against me, but I'm so happy with my life that I forgive you. Now, let me give you another example. Uh, the Libertarian Concentration Camp Guard. Here's the situation. In order to be a, a Nazi concentration camp guard, you have to kill 100 Jews or gypsies or blacks or gays or whoever it is per day. However... I'm a, libertarian, uh, I'm a libertarian and I want to save people and I go and I become a libertarian concentration camp guard and I only kill 90 a day. Why 90? Because that's the uh, uh, lowest amount that I can do and get away with not being caught. If I only kill 89, they'll catch me and they'll kill me and I won't be able to do this anymore. But if I kill 90, they'll say, oh, well, you know, he had a bad day, whatever, you know, he's okay. So. The reason I'm doing this is not to kill 90, God forbid, but to save 10. And we stipulate that these 10 would have died anyway. 
okay, so at the end of the week, I kill uh, 630 and I save 70. And now comes the Nuremberg trials and I'm, I'm in the dock and I'm honest, uh, I'm not uh, committing fraud. I say, yes, I killed 630, I guess it is. Uh, but I saved 70. And the reason I did it was to save 70. And these 70 would have gone. Okay, so now the libertarian view is who decides whether to forgive me or not? And I say it's the heirs of the victims. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the mother, the father, the, the child, the brother, uh, somebody who's the heir of the victim. And there are 630 of them. And I plead with them for my life. And I say, look, I wish I could have saved your uncle, your brother, your cousin, your father, your child. But I can only save uh, 10. And if I had uh, saved any more, I couldn't have saved anyone. Right, right. So I plead with you, please uh, let me free because I was really a hero. I saved 70 people and your people would have died anyway. And, and I only picked them at random. I, it's not as if I was against your relatives. I, I just, you know, and I would say as a libertarian that it's up to them. If any one of them wants to put me to death, they have that right. Uh, but I think they really should give me a medal and maybe have a ticket tape parade in my honor before they execute me because I really saved 70 people who would have otherwise died. So now getting back to your, your lady, um, uh, what I say is that it's up to the victim and <clears throat> the victim might, uh, say, you know, um, uh, I'm very happy with my life, and I, I thank you for committing fraud on me, and I'm not going to penalize you. On the other hand, he could be a real <laughs> dirty rat and say, even though I'm happy with my life, you committed fraud with me, and I'm going to get you. And then I think he would have the right to get her. Let me give you one more case. One of the things that really is despicable is torturing animals. I'm not talking about uh, doing research on animals, you sort of have to have a hard heart, you know. Not so much when they torture animals to improve makeup or something like that, but when they do it to cure cancer and they kill rats or do something to chimpanzees, you know, I don't much like it, but what the heck. I'm not even talking about dog fighting or, or rooster fighting because, you know, it's sort of natural. I'm talking about really despicable stuff uh, that I won't even mention, but I'm sure you can imagine. And now, did they violate the libertarian code? No. But I go to one of them and I punch him in the nose. <laughs> and now he brings me to court and um, I tell the judge exactly why. In other words, the facts are not in dispute. We know what's going on. And I would say that the <laughs> any judge or any jury or most judges and juries are going to violate the libertarian code. Because if I punch the, the animal torture in the nose, it should be the same penalty as I punch a you in the nose who are an innocent person. In other words, uh, what, you know, uh, the uh, justice, the statue is blind. Uh, we, we don't look at anything, but I'm just saying that the human condition is such that I would expect that even in a government court, uh, let alone a, a free market court, uh, that uh, people w would, uh, <laughs> would uh, what do you call it, uh, give me a light sentence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because most people find uh, torturing animals really despicable. So this is sort of an anomaly or, or another paradox that, that pure libertarianism would indicate that I, uh, who punched the animal torturer, get uh, the same punishment as anyone else. Uh, and yet in reality we can expect reasonably that I would get much less of a penalty, maybe just a slap on the wrist or, or maybe an award or something. But if if that occurred, strictly speaking, uh, justice would not prevail. prevail. If I got a light sentence for doing the same thing, like uh, if, if you punch someone in the uh, innocent person in the nose, uh, you got a heavy penalty, and I punished some, uh, an animal torture in the nose and got a light penalty, justice would not be prevailing because it was the same punch in the nose, and therefore it should be the same punishment. So society could enforce a democratic um, view of justice, in a sense. So, for example, if uh, if the society around uh, this girl who puts up her shingle and and uh, acts as a suicide coach, if that society around her viewed suicide as something which a person has a right to do then nothing would happen to her for 
um, for helping other people commit suicide. If they viewed it as something that it was evil, ethically evil, not uh, morally, uh, not uh, not a violation, right? Not a violation of libertarian principles, right. but but ethically wrong. They might ostracize her, and oh. she'd go to the she'd go to the grocery store, and they'd say, "I'm sorry, we're not accepting your uh, patronage here." Oh, absolutely, and and certainly the animal torturer. Uh, if we knew who he was, uh, look, ostracism is. Uh, uh, all right. If we believe in free association, we should be able to ostracize or uh, 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 refuse to deal with anyone for any reason. And now we get into other issues. Well, how about if they're black or gay or Jewish or uh, bald or whatever? And the libertarian answer is yes, you can ostracize anyone for any reason or no reason. Uh, and we can predict that this suicide uh, coach would be heavily ostracized. But that wouldn't vi violate her rights because she has no right to anyone else's uh, interaction. Right. And so if somebody punched her in the nose, the court would very much have the right to say, we're sorry, but we don't care. No, no, it wouldn't have the right to. Why not? Because... Uh, As individuals, they would have the right to say, we're sorry, but we don't want to hear your case. Well, then they wouldn't be upholding justice. Because justice... Uh, look, a, a libertarian court could but, say we're, we're not doing it. We're not hearing the case. But if they, but, if they, they, but they might be still serving the needs of, of the majority of their customers. That's true, but there's a difference between the needs of the customers and justice. I, I could see a libertarian court not taking on any particular case because no libertarian court has to take on every case. But if they took on the case and then they gave her a. a uh, a slap on the wrist, or rather they gave the person who, who punched her in the nose a slap on the wrist, they would be unjust. Just like the court would be unjust if they gave me a, a light penalty for uh, punching the animal torturer in the nose. So there's a difference between what justice requires and what uh, good business requires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not always the same thing as in this case. We're coming up with a lot of anomalies here. And yet, and yet the tendency is that if individuals serve the needs of other individuals uh, in, in a more business-minded sense, that overall justice tends to happen. Overall, it tends to, but not only, look, I could hire you to go kill somebody, Murder Incorporated, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're uh, doing what this customer wants you to do. I pay you 10000 go kill Joe. Uh, you're a good businessman, <laughs> but neither of us is very just because Joe is an innocent person. We shouldn't be killing him. Right. So, right. so, so as so. a businessman, I might know that killing Joe would be very bad for, for my business. Oh, no, no. It's good for your business. You're, you're an assassin. Right. So I might, I might as, a, as, a, as, as an assassin who's running an assassination business, know that killing people who have some kind of negatives against them would be good for business. Whereas just killing innocents just because people want to would, would uh, cause ostracism, let's say. Okay, well, yeah, but, you know, we should do a lot more than ostracize <laughs> assassins who kill innocent people. Right, exactly. So, so having self-defensive violence used against me as an assassin would be pretty bad for business? I'm not following you. Uh, you're zigging, I'm zagging. Uh, start again. Well. Are, are you a legitimate assassin, namely an executioner of murderers? Or are you a bad assassin, namely you'll just kill anyone that any customer wants you to kill? And and if you're a good assassin, and there could be such a good, uh, such a thing as a good assassin, namely a person who puts, who an executioner who puts to death uh, murderers, uh, bad assassins. So if you're a good assassin, you're a good guy. Now let's make you a bad assassin. <laughs> if you're a bad assassin, you should be killed yourself. And right, right. More, more than ostracized, and, and anyone who hires you uh, should be uh, uh, aiding and abetting murder and, and should be punished as a, you know, an accessory to murder. Well, now that we've solved all the world's <laughs> problems... <laughs> but, but in court... The point is that in court, a a good assassin would would not be probably the courts would uh, a libertarian court at least would say uh, we're not going to take this case. 
No, no, no. A good assassin is uh, an innocent person. A good assassin is a, a, an executioner. Uh, by assassin, I mean somebody who kills. Right. But, and uh, execution. But, but when we say assassin, I'm assuming that we're talking about somebody who, let's say, uh, there's some rapist who who escaped and and now he's he's living in some other town, and you hire an assassin to go and and just kill him in his sleep, right? Or just uh, he's walking around in his living room, and a, a you know you sniper. He fired fired him with a sniper rifle, and he's done. End well, I don't I don't think that the appropriate punishment for rape is is uh, the death penalty. There was this wonderful case in um, oh what, what's that trilogy with the um, uh, the mafia? Oh, the Godfather. Oh, the Godfather, and the baker's daughter was raped, and the right, baker but... asked the Godfather to kill the rapist. And the Godfather, I thought, was very just. The Godfather said he wasn't a libertarian. He didn't have the two teeth for a two theory. But he said, look, he only raped her. He didn't kill her. I'm not going to kill him, but I'm going to beat the crap out of him or have uh, my, my people beat the crap out of him, which is roughly akin to being raped. Well, they beat well, the crap out of her, too. Well... In that scenario, that would be aggravated rape. Right. Uh, I mean, if it was rape without beating her, or rape with—I I don't remember in the movie which kind of rape it was. But the point is that uh, my sense of justice is: if you rape someone, uh, it's much more just to beat the crap out of you than to kill you. Although you should have to play Russian roulette, and and you might have to end up dead anyway. But that's a whole other issue. Uh, so if there was a rapist and the good assassin just killed him, I think he would be punishing him too much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But so let's take a better case. So let's say a murderer. Yeah, a murderer. A, a murderer killed somebody, and we stipulate that this is true. That there's no accident. That there's no misunderstanding. And when we're not killing, uh, we're not getting the wrong guy. We got the right guy. Sure, the good assassin will uh, will hopefully bring him the court. And do it judiciously, and but somehow, if he, uh, if this can't happen, if the only way to get him is to uh, uh, use a, a what do you call it, a rifle, a sniper rifle, yeah, sure, get well, him. Well, Walter, have you Walter, ever heard of assassination please. politics? No. Um, I'll send it to you. It's the idea that a a free market for assassination would would make it impossible for uh, for a state to exist. Have you heard of this? A free market for assassination? Now we're talking good assassins or bad assassins? Good assassins. Well, in a sense. So, for example, if um, if a well, every law, right? Every law is a death threat, essentially, right? In effect. So if, so if somebody comes to me and mugs me, they, they're telling me, they're pointing a gun at me and they're saying, give me your wallet or I'm going to kill you, right? And uh, if, if somebody calls it taxes, they say, give me, give me tax money or I'm going to kill you, you know, well, or I'm going to use violence against you up to and including your death, right? right. So, so every, every uh, action like that is essentially a death threat, whether it's a mugging or whether it's a tax man. Well, I don't know if I can go along with that. I mean, if I steal some bubble gum from you, I'm a forget about whether I'm a six-year-old kid because kids are different. But I'm an adult, and I steal some bubble gum from your grocery store, and I run out with it. It's hardly a death threat, wouldn't right, it? Right, right. So shoplifting is not a death threat, but right. um, or fraud, or I mean, there are right. other crimes that are not really death threats. Right, fraud would not be. So so counterfeiting would not be a death yeah. threat. Because right. you know maybe they, you catch the counterfeit and he says, "Listen, you know, I'm sorry. I'll give you, I'll give you all your stuff back. No problem." He doesn't necessarily try to uh, continue perpetrating the crime through violence. Well, I, I would say a counterfeiter of legitimate money, uh, not a counterfeiter of counterfeit money, and I've written about that, uh, would be a criminal. And even if he said, "I'll give it back to you," I think we should still punish him. But he's not really imposing a death threat. Right. Although you know, a counterfeiter, I mean. Money being so important, uh, a lot of people could die uh, indirectly if there was heavy counterfeiting. Uh, so let's leave counterfeiting off the table and just talk about, I don't know, stealing bubble gum. That is not a death threat. Right. Right. Or shoplifting or something like that. But a ticket for speeding is. 
Well, now, speeding is interesting because government owns the roads. In one of my books, I claim that government shouldn't own the roads because some 35,000 people a year die on the roads. And I estimate that maybe 5,000 or 10,000 would die if the, the roads were privatized. So here, I think the people who run the roads are really guilty of murdering, say, 25,000 people a year if under, uh, well, actually 35,000, that's a whole other issue. Uh, but 25,000 extra people die because the government runs the roads, whereas if they were privatized, many fewer people would die. Uh, you know, I've even called for um, uh, imprisonment for people who support the minimum wage law. Because mm -hmm. the minimum wage law makes it impossible for people, uh, let's say the minimum wage law is $7 an hour, and I'm worth $6 an hour, I can't get a job. And if I get a job and I stay employed, my employer will go broke eventually, so I won't have a job. So they're really guilty of coercively making me unemployed. I mean, suppose somebody went into the inner city with a gun and said, okay, look, you get a job, I'll kill you. That guy is a bad guy. So, you know, the, the people who, who uh, I'm not talking about... Well, I take Bernie Sanders, my old buddy. He and I went to high school together. We were on the track team together. We were sort of friends. Now he's pumping for a minimum wage law of 15, but he's not just a journalist. He's a senator who is in a, in a uh, capacity in a where he, I'm sorry, he's, he's in a in position. A position. He can impose it. Well, uh, in one of my recent articles, I said I sort of favor him uh, as the Democratic nominee, but he should run from, from jail because he should really be in jail. Because he, he's, he's a criminal. I mean, and anyone, uh, again, free speech, you, you want to advocate minimum wage, fine. Or not fine, but at least the libertarian legal code will not get you. But the way I see it, if you're in a position, whether you're a policeman uh, or a, a senator or a congressman or, you know, somebody, uh, uh, the city council or whatever it is, uh, and you're responsible for that, you're a criminal. And, and his, his crime is that he's imposing this uh, $15 minimum wage through threats of violence. Yes. Up to just, and including your death. If he just said, look, I favor people getting $15 an hour, <laughs> that would be fine. I favor it too. Uh, everyone should get 15 at least, and everyone should get 100 an hour at least. That would be nice. Uh, but uh, you're right. Uh, what he's really doing is uh, compulsorily unemploying or making it impossible for young, unskilled, mainly black uh, workers to, to get jobs. And I think that's pretty despicable. Right. right. So, so would it be self-defense to kill him? Well, I know about killing him. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, so, so let's, let's simplify I, the I argument would make a, a little bit I more. would make him play Russian roulette, and he would have the chance well, of being killed. killed. But, uh, you know, we, we don't want to impose the death penalty for everything. <laughs> So, yeah. so let's take that example of the, of a mugger, right? A mugger says, give me your wallet or I'm going to kill you or I'm going to use violence against you, right? And I might have to kill you. And if I do end up killing you, I'm not going to feel bad about it. Well, he right? might, but he'll do it well, anyway. He might, but, but he's going to do it anyways, right? Um, and let's say you get pulled over by a police officer or let's say you're paying somebody minimum wage, uh, less than a minimum wage and a police officer comes in and he says, Either you fire this person or you pay him more. But if you don't do either of those things, I'm going to use violence against you. And if you try to defend yourself, I'm going to kill you. Right? Yeah. So how is how are those two scenarios different? Well, I don't think that they're different, except that it's illegal for me to say that they're different. Uh, rather, it's illegal for me to say that they're the same. And therefore, I don't want to say it because I don't want to go to jail. Right. And I don't want to be uh, saying that anyone should be killing cops. Right, exactly. At least, at least not in any country that I've ever lived in or might visit. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in, in the Never Never Land of Ruritania or some imaginary country, sure. Uh, you know, uh, the cops uh, uh, uphold victimless crimes like uh, uh, drugs or uh, sex, prostitution, gambling, whatever, minimum wage. Uh, sure, you're entitled to use defense against them, but it's illegal to say that, uh, so I can't say it. Right. I won't so, say it. So in Ancapistan, right, in the uh, the fictional uh, mythical land of, of Ancapistan, a, uh, a person sets up uh, a, a company, an organization, they say, well, we're going to enforce uh, some kind of uh, arbitrary laws or, or uh, whatever in, in, in certain area, right? 
they take over one of the cities in Ancapistan. They go around, uh, you know, p- pushing their weight around and telling people, oh, you can't wear a blue shirt and you can't wear a black shirt and so on and so forth. It would be justifiable to use self-defense against them. Use self-defense, but always in the gentlest manner possible. Of course. Uh, if, if you can defend yourself uh, without killing the person by just tying them up with a rope or something, then I think it's incumbent upon you to do that. I don't think that the first step should be uh, killing the bad guy. I think the first step would be to, to um, in the most gentlest manner possible. Now, it might not be possible, but I think that's part of the libertarian code also, that you, you just don't use a bazooka first off. You uh, uh, try um, try talking to him, maybe. I don't right. know. So that would be the, pr- the principle of proportionality. <laughs> yeah. And, and yet, I don't think that you, would, that you would advocate that a person who's facing a mugger pointing a gun at them should not shoot. Like, let's say, if they have the ability to, if they have a chance to grab their gun... You know, yeah. let's say they have a concealed carry permit, they can grab their gun. They should do whatever is uh, necessary to maximally end the situation. Yeah, but but and, hypothetically, and if they could, if they had a rubber, if they had two guns, one with a, a what do you call it, a, a lead bullet, and one with a rubber bullet, right, right, they should use the rubber bullet. But right. you know, if you've only got one gun and it's got lead in it, you know, uh, sure. Back to suicide. Uh, Let's see if we if we reach any sort of conclusion. If if a woman puts out her shingle and says, "I want to be a suicide coach," a libertarian court might uh, might say, "Well, we decline to prosecute any cases against her." Yeah, they might. Well, I think we agreed that ethically she's not a good guy, and. Uh, I think we agreed that, uh, the, from a libertarian point of view, she is not violating the law. And we also discussed uh, whether the grandmother <laughs> can outbid the uh, the grandson for mm-hmm. her services. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we sort of covered uh, that issue. And if, and if the grandmother would outbid the grandson for the services, she also might not be prosecuted by a libertarian court. Well, she would be. Uh, we remember we divided it into two cases: one where she was honest, in which case she was not committing fraud, and uh, namely she told the grandson, "Look, you know, your grandmother outbid uh, me." And of course, then the answer was, "Well, then the grandson will go somewhere else." So the grandmother, uh, the grandmother's effort wouldn't prevail. And the other case was she did it fraudulently, namely she took the grandmother's money and she took the grandson's money, and she acted in the grandmother's. Um, uh, uh, efforts or she supported the grandmother's point of view and she saved the son and then we uh, had the case well uh, uh, would the son uh, then be justified in accusing her of fraud and uh, I think I said yes although it would be unlikely and hopefully he wouldn't uh, and then, that's how we got into the Nazi uh, mm-hmm. uh, concentration mm-hmm. camp guard case so so, so just to add a, another another small point if uh, if people were putting out shingles for uh, you know, suicide coach services, and other people would go to them and say, "Listen, you're charging a hundred dollars for your services, and I'll pay you a thousand dollars to close up shop and and sign a contract saying that you'll never offer these services again in the future." And enough people were to do that, a society could be free of such services. Sure, sure. Unless unless the uh, suicide lady said, "Look, you know, it's a matter of principle." Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. love suicide, and uh, no money will um, overcome my love for uh, suicide coaching. Well, then you'd have some. But uh, I, I mean, getting back to reality, I mean, th- this case is such an anomaly because it, it's so unique. Mm-hmm. How many <laughs> suicide coaches are there? <laughs> I mean, if you Google suicide coaches, I don't think you're going to find too much. So, as a practical problem, I don't think this is, um, uh, you know, a, a pressing issue. All right. All right. Well, well, thank you very thank much you. for the conversation. Uh, let me ask you about yourself. Let sure, me interview please. you. Um, uh, you seem to um, uh, be uh, very con- conversant with libertarianism. Uh, I said a lot of things that any non-libertarian would go, what? Uh, <laughs> and you just, oh, yeah, yeah, well, this is reasonable. Uh, what's your background? I'm a libertarian. Ah, how did you become a libertarian? So uh, when I was maybe 11 years old, I read a Mark Twain book called uh, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Have you read it? No. Oh, it's excellent. 
So there's a chapter in that book called the Sixth Century Political Economy. And he, uh, Mark Twain gave the most incredible, to my you know, 11-year-old mind, the most incredible explanation of economics there, which uh, literally blew my mind. I, I sat down, maybe when I was 12 or 13, I sat down and started reading um, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which is just very difficult to read. I made it several hundred pages in before I could not even look at it, the book anymore. For a 12 year old, that's pretty good. <laughs> I, I grew up in a family where um, my parents, you know, I'd ask my father a question, he would say, oh, let's see if there's a book on it. And we'd go down to the library and we'd go check out a bunch of books. So we didn't have a television in the house and that's what we did, we read. So reading was always very easy for us. And then, uh, you know, I started getting more and more into economics. I read uh, all kinds of stuff and I ended up somehow finding uh, the Mises Institute website and I started reading the Mises Daily religiously uh, and then eventually I found LewRockwell.com I read much of your stuff and uh, Murray Rothbard is unbelievable I, I just love uh, love the way he writes Yo, Murray, Murray the man he's Mr. Libertarian he's magnificent uh, Yaakov um, what is your day job? I, I do uh, food industry consulting. I see. Okay. We spoke about this last year, actually. Um, oh. So I work for a uh, company that sends me out to other companies to consult on uh, on food manufacturing projects. I see. Okay, good. Well, thanks for interviewing me. Uh, it was a pleasure, and I, I'd be happy to uh, you know be interviewed by you again on some other esoteric issue. Thank you very much for your time. You take Always care. Always a pleasure. Take care. Bye.